Hello, my name is Catherine Ng, and I'm co-director of Choctaw Code Talkers. Uh, the world premiere will be here at South by Southwest uh, 2022, and it is part of the Our Worlds platform. And I'm honored to be here today with B.G. Smalling, who's the great-grandson of Calvin Wilson. It is a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of the Choctaw Code Talker Association, we are most pleased to be able to witness this. We're pleased that Nuchi Neshoba I was able to participate in helping you get information, and also Judy Allen from Chalk Donation as our historian. I know she was very pleased to participate. Yeah, she's been wonderful. So uh, Judy, uh, just as a background, she was one of the original people who we contacted when we realized that Choctaw Nation had a, a really just a plethora of information, of course, about the Code Talkers on their website. And she was very generous with her knowledge. And she even, um, you know, one of the first times that we had experimented with one of our workflows, which mm -hmm. is to send the 360 immersive cameras out into the field. Mm -hmm. And she brought the camera to the Choctaw Nation um, Memorial for the veterans and recorded the space. And so based on that, we were able to create one of our activations on the app called Here Choctaw Code Talkers. Tell me a little bit about your family growing up and um, the sort of family lore of uh, your great grandfather and what you grew up knowing about what he did and contributed in World War One. You know, firstly, as it relates to the Choctaw Code Talkers, they uh, maintained their clearances and they, 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 they're all the secrecy and the mandate that went with it. So virtually no one in our families knew. And it was only in 1989 when the then uh, Minister of Defense for the French Republic came to Oklahoma looking for five men and arrived with five knighthoods. People were kind of, what is going on? Because it was very unusual not only that uh, you have the longest standing uh, French Minister of Defense in their history show up to Oklahoma unannounced, but shows up looking for five Choctaw men. And from that, w the families begin to ask questions. And then fragments begin to come together. Little anecdotes that were never in full. Sometimes it would be about a location in France. Sometimes it would be about a piece of equipment. The Minister of Defense, Pierre uh, Mesnier, what he did was catalyze a moment because it wasn't the federal government that had recognized them. It was the French government. That and I think, I think that yeah. that needs to be pushed because, yes, because of the Curtis Act, Choctaws, along with the Chickasaws, the Muscogee Creek, uh, the Seminoles and the Cherokee in Oklahoma, they were extended U.S. citizenship unilaterally, was not asked for. When the Choctaw Code Talkers went, they did not go ostensibly as U.S. citizens. They were going, fulfilling the obligation of the old alliance, and the old alliance being with France. Hmm. So the reciprocity from France was the knighthoods. And we saw this weird moment in our history as Choctaw where the old Tushka, or warrior structure, voluntary warrior structure, it becomes integrated into a new nation, the United States, as a part of the professional you know, soldier corps. In 1989, with France acknowledging our contribution, that galvanized, galvanized us, particularly um, Nuchi Neshoba, Judy Allen, to, to start lobbying, to petition the United States as to why this was not acknowledged. And it was through their efforts over the decades that it culminated in, with the U.S. Congress finally issuing not only the acknowledgement of it, but the Congressional Medals. And as a family association, we chose not to close the legislation, but to keep the legislation open so that any tribe within the United States who had both in World War I after us, but also in World War II and other conflicts had code talkers that they could join the legislation and not have to go what we had to go through. It's so fascinating that it was really the French that catalyzed the Absolutely. recognition. And why do you feel that, why do you think they felt that they needed to do that? It was that particular foreign minister at the time. Oh. He was very much uh, a part of the French resistance. Mm -hmm. 
He was a part uh, and an initiate under Charles de Gaulle, prodding Charles de Gaulle, uh, President de Gaulle, to to change the the way France dealt with other nations, uh, their protectorates. You know, principally at the time, you know, he had been very involved with with removing the French out of what was into China, then Vietnam, and uh, also in Algiers, in Algeria. And so as he himself had been a freedom fighter, mm -hmm. he was feeling that very intensely. Mm -hmm. And so coming out of it and watching France leave colonial spaces, he's looking back too as a, as a counterinsurgent you know, expert and an insurgent expert. And he, in his studies, he was coming across the Choctaw Code Talkers in World War I, and he realized there was a moment that right. he wanted to rectify. That's so interesting. And so how do you think the timeline works with, because certainly there are memorials, um, American memorials and French memorials in that region. Mm -hmm. And until I began working on this project and researching it with my co-director, Kilma, we realized um, how to this day, how much the landscape remains affected by oh, that absolutely. war. So one fascinating thing we found out about was about the war forests. And they are lush and beautiful and um, they're not cut down for development because they really can't be. So they're filled with strafed wood, and if you cut them, someone's gonna lose an eye. And so they just remain. And um, and then certainly there's uh, uh, the, the Montfasson Memorial, and then there's the American Memorial. So um, in terms of the recognition, it was you said it was uh, 1989 thereabouts yes. when the French ministry came to you guys. So um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to, to um, find out a little bit more about how that intersected with the building of the monuments for the soldiers on the French side. Um, if you also look at some of the, uh, some of the different um, uh, cemeteries and, and, and really large, almost epic style uh, sculptures that are in the World War uh, I era uh, cemeteries in France, there's a use of a lot of uh, Indian country imagery you'll find lots of very, from an artistic perspective, they're very compelling art deco meets native buffaloes and bisons and imageries and even swastika and stuff like that, which, you know, for the Choctaw people, that was very, and for all of the Southeastern tribes, very sacred, you know, imagery. Uh, later on as, because of the Code Talkers, because of what had happened and what, when Oklahoma saw what had happened, with the only places where native men could enlist was in Texas. They went to the 36th. Mm -hmm. They created the 45th infantry. In the 45th infantry, you start seeing a lot of native, you know, influence. Even the the original design of the 45th infantry was a swastika. And as you know, Germany rearms, they change that from the swastika to the Thunderbird, still keeping it with the Choctaw designs. Would you know anything about how the French artisans who created those memorials and got the iconography, um, how did they research it? I mean, was that something that they um, the, saw? I think at the time, and this is just speculation, because none of, there was very little data mm -hmm. at the time. I've not certainly not come across any substantial data about the artists and where they're coming mm -hmm. from, but there is that trend that has always persisted of that almost the Jean Jacques Rousseau concept of the noble savage, that noblesse uh, savage. And, you know, then you have with, on the Teutonic side with the Germans, you have Karl May. So these two people have influenced this imagery of Indian country as this very regal kind of combatant. Mm -hmm. But the effect was carried on into World War II. I mean, there are there were different orders that were given from um, Hitler down as to how to deal with Native American prisoners of war. They were very different because there, this myth that came out of the First World War confrontation informed the second. And so, very interesting. Yeah, and I guess that segues into my other question um, because you're an artist. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I guess I would love to hear more about uh, the subjects um, upon which you base your art and uh, you know, really some of your thoughts behind um, art making in general as a uh, citizen of Choctaw Nation. Well, I can, I'll, I'll tie it direct, you know, firstly with your topic because uh, when, Choc when the National Museum of the American Indian uh, was, was, con was opened, and for those who weren't from the United States, 
That's a function of our Smithsonian, which is our national gallery system in Washington, D.C. The first tribe that did projects there were Choctaw Nation, and the first topic we tackled were the Code Talkers. We used that as a way of underpinning the ongoing sort of lobbying efforts in Washington, D.C. to get more of the legislators to walk across the mall or, uh, or the gardens to us. And there was a series of lectures that I conducted on that point of where this intersection of imagery and they met. And one of the things that I used was my great-grandfather. I have often considered the imagery of what he encountered upon arrival you, you alluded to the enormous amounts of ordinance that have been just decimated, or not even decimated, had obliterated the forests. And so, you know, it would have been something akin to like what Tolkien was writing out of Mordor, where it was a wasteland, a wasteland that was toxic on every level because of the chemical warfare that was used, along with the sludge, along with the feces, along with everything that was dehumanizing of being in trench warfare because you were being absorbed into the mud. You were being reclaimed into mud. And for us, our origin story is that we emerge from mud. Hmm. And suddenly these men are being melded back into that. The codes themselves, several of which were based on boarding schools. So boarding school structures, boarding school layouts were built into the codes, so they were codes even from against, against other Choctaws hmm. who could speak, or so if that was a capability. And that in itself is, is, is an incredible irony because the boarding school structure in Canada and other Commonwealth countries, they would call them residential schools. These were places in which they were designed to assimilate the Native American, to take the American Indian out of the person, and most certainly the, the most, the, where it would start is with the language, and suddenly uh, something that had been targeted by the United States government, beaten, starved out of these men, was suddenly what was being used to save the other soldiers. What happens after that, his experience in coming back to the United States, coming back to his mm -hmm. clan area. And he, he was a man who grayed very early in life, and not just grayed, very, went to ice white hair. Mm -hmm. He was a man who took to intense walks. He would walk everywhere. And he was also a man who would go out into the woods. He, he was a stomper, and stomp yeah. Stomping means that in our traditional uh, religion, um, the way that they would dance is you'll, you'll hear a southern expression in the United States of stomping grounds. And, but the stomping grounds were, were, are related to the southeasterners' areas where they dance and where they have their ceremonies. And he would go into the backyard, into the woods, I should say, and there was a particular stump. And he would spend intense hours there stomping, so much so that there's still a rut. The stump has gone away, it's kind of dissolved now back into the earth, but the rut's still there. And why do you think he did that? Do you think it was some form of almost therapy? For yeah, yeah, it was. He, he was incredibly private about what had happened, particularly from uh, the French perspective, uh, both Taking, taking a cue from where the Choctaw Coast Talkers are, the French and the, Ch and the Ch Choctaws have had a very long, interesting relationship. It has been less acrimonious as, as far as like the, you know, the, the Choctaw and the British or the Choctaw, certainly with the Spaniards. They're, the French have incredible history of military correspondence and reportage related to Choctaw country not just to that, but going back into the 1700s.